for them. Um, later we're going to be hearing from Pete, who's going to be uh, continuing our sermon se uh, series, He Healed the Sick. This week's sermon is entitled, Raising the Dead. Um, Pete used to be a doctor, so in so many ways he's sort of the perfect person to be speaking on these subjects, I should say. <laughs> anyway, there will be Crash and Good News Club today, um, as organised by Steve. River, which is fantastic. Um, the people sitting on my right, just so you know, are wearing masks and are still keeping, keeping themselves safe. So it would be helpful if everyone respected that. Um, and also, just to be aware that not everybody's ready for hugs and kisses yet. Please respect each other's space and don't be a space invader. Okay. At the end, all welcome to stay with the refreshments as supplied by the Bennets. Very good of them. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can meet here this morning to worship you, to learn more about you, to support each other and to meet Jesus. Please bless our time together. Teach and encourage us so that we can leave here all fired up to serve you better. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Okay, our opening hymn today is Come People of the Risen King. Um, we don't have Jeff in my approaches this morning, but we do have can Jeff. <laughs> so Jeff, in a can. So uh, we'd like to all stand. We're going to sing. Come People of the Risen King.
Please sit down. Okay, news time. Just a, well, three items to mention today. Um, Lee's plan to stay for church, uh, for lunch after church on Sunday the 5th of September. Um, as sadly, but important, we can be saying goodbye to Pete and Eleanor as they uh, move, and Joel, of course, as they move on to the next part of their spiritual journey into ministry. So, um, plan to be there. It should be good. Nice lunch. We'll say more about it next week, I'm sure. Uh, then on the 12th of September, it's Back to Church Sunday. Um, if you know someone who used to come to church and hasn't been for a while, um, or didn't come to church at all, bring them along. Invite them to come back. Invite them to come and have a look at us. See what they think. Um, it's especially for visitors or people that haven't been around for a while. Um, there's going to be invitations for you to give out uh, coming soon, so look out for that. And a piece of very good news, Jonathan Haynes and Ruth have announced their engagement. Hey! So, if you can see us on screen, congratulations. Uh, right, now we're going to be, um, I've, got, I've got a question here for everybody. Um, it's, we're going to be talk, thinking a little bit about sin for a few minutes. I know it's not the best subject to be talking about, but it, it, it is something that's very important to us in our Christian lives. Um, what sort of sins do we regularly commit in our daily lives? I'm not looking for major specifics, but what sort of sins do we regularly do? Each week we come to Grace Church and we confess our sins together in a confession, which we're going to do together in a minute. We're going to do that shortly, all together. Um, but what sort of sins are we actually confessing to? What I want you to do in a minute is to shout out some sins um, that we commit. Obviously, like I said, nothing too specific, but kind of the sort of things that we do. For instance, I get a bit cross now and again, a bit of anger maybe. Um, but uh, Elaine's going to come and help us with this. She's going to write them up on this whiteboard. Am I the sin expert? <laughs> because she knows all about us. <laughs> <laughs> We are. Is anyone who not sinned at all this week? No, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> so, okay. So, if you've got anything, anything you can think of, and I've already said some of that on that, you've got to write that up there. Has anyone got anything they'd like to uh, add to that? Greed. Greed. Mm. Good one. Me. 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 Yes. Me. Pride. Pride. Gossip. 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 Selfish. Selfish. Can I use a big word? Intolerant. Intolerant. No. Why are you looking at me when you say that? Should I say what that means? Because that's quite a big word for some little ones, isn't it? It's when I'm kind of, other people are being a certain way and I just move really on them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There's nothing we can do with them. There's nothing we can do about them at all. If it's down to us to deal with our sin, that, that would be hopeless, wouldn't it? Because there's nothing we can personally do about our sin. Apart from trying not to do them. But there's nothing we can do once they're done. The amazing and wonderful news, though, is that Jesus, our Saviour, died to save us from our sins so that we can have everlasting life. Only He can wipe our sins away. And only He can wipe our sins away. Just as He made us here now. And because of Jesus, like this white man, any second now, we can have a fresh, clean start. But we can only do that by confessing our sins to God. So, we're going to join together now in the words of confession, which should be up there. So, all together, we're going to say the confession together. Let's go. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Amen. May the God of love forgive us our sins and assure us of his eternal love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to sing again now. And this song we're about to sing is about stopping and trusting in ourselves and trusting in him. Because we can't trust in ourselves, can we? We're not very good at that. But we can totally trust in him. Let's stand and sing, Father, you are the King of Heaven.
welcoming and, and, and Jackie at the back there. Welcome back. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, lovely to see you. Everyone say hello to me and Jodie. Lovely to see you. Right, we're just going to say um, a quick prayer as our children go to their groups. Heavenly Father, please would you be with all our children this morning and those who care for them and teach them. Open their eyes and ears and hearts to learn more about you. Keep them safe and happy and bless their time now. Amen. Amen. Bye bye. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks, Elena. Great. So, before we hear uh, God's word from Pete, um, let's sing about what we really believe in. Um, this is really an amazing and beautiful song of praise. It speaks of the depths. Jesus went to save us, um, and then about the wonder of his glorious resurrection. Everything I believe in one song is pretty cool. Our, our Father everlasting can stand and sing.
you sit down. Just before Peter speaks to us, the lady has a reading for us. Verses 14 to 26, which you can page find on page 974 if you have a Bible from church. So, Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 14. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skin will, skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. While he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. When Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, Go away, the girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. Well, good morning. Do keep your Bibles open in front of you so we can follow along together. Let me pray uh, as we begin. Heavenly Father, would you grow and strengthen and encourage and mature your church here this morning uh, as we hear from your word. Would you uh, open our ears, soften our hearts, that we might respond rightly to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, uh, let me ask you a question. What goes through your head when someone mentions death? How does the thought of death make you feel? It's a difficult word to hear, isn't it? In fact, it's a word that we'd rather not mention at all. We prefer to use uh, various euphemisms, passed away, kicked the bucket, breathed their last. My uh, grandmother's favourite, they've popped off their perch. <laughs> Death is something we'd rather not think about, uh, let alone have to face uh, ourselves. And yet, uh, death is just about the only thing that's absolutely certain in life. But life can be pretty scary, can't it? And perhaps, if you're honest, uh, you're gripped with the fear of death. Fear over the uncertainty of death. What will happen when I die? Am I really ready to die? Maybe you think of the deep sorrow of losing a loved one, the loneliness of being, of being left behind, or the worry of leaving a loved one behind. And maybe you feel an inexpressible emptiness as you watch a coffin being lowered down into the ground or disappearing behind the crematorium and the curtain. What now? What next? Well, perhaps it's the fear of death eventually knocking at your door, one vir 
virus has thrown a whole nation, a whole world into complete panic and fear, hasn't it? Or maybe it's just the old fear of hearing your doctor say uh, those uh, dreaded words, the C word, it's cancer. Some of you uh, will know, as, as Andy mentioned, I used to work uh, as a doctor myself, and the conversation that I hated more than any other was when it was time uh, to speak to a patient or their loved one uh, and say, we've done everything we can, there's nothing more that we could offer. It's time to allow uh, nature to play its course and to keep them as comfortable as possible. There's nothing more we can offer. It's completely hopeless, isn't it? Ultimately, we feel hopeless when faced with death. And where there's no hope, there's only fear. But is that really how it's meant to be? Is death always supposed to have the last laugh? Is fear really the only response we can have when confronted with death? Well, in these last few chapters uh, of Matthew, uh, Jesus has been showing us that he has authority over all spheres of life. Authority over nature, he calms the storm. Authority over sickness, he says the word and the centurion's servant is healed. Authority over sin, he can forgive the paralytic their sins. Authority over demons, he casts them out into a herd of pigs. Authority over us, he says the word, and they follow. But now we reach the climax, as Jesus is confronted with the ultimate enemy, the greatest obstacle, death itself. Can he really have authority even over death? And if so, what does that mean for us, for me, for you? But before we get an answer, uh, a question is brought to Jesus, and this time it's by John's disciples. Jesus and his disciples are having a good time. They're at Matthew's house, they're enjoying uh, dinner. No doubt uh, Matthew wanted to celebrate. Uh, he was now a follower of Christ, so uh, he'd laid a great spread. He'd opened the best wine. It was time to party. Jesus was with them. But John's disciples uh, they have an issue, they don't like uh, that Jesus and his disciples are having a good time uh, while they and the Pharisees are busy fasting. And so while Jesus is still enjoying dinner at Matthew's house, they decide to ask Jesus about it. Look down uh, at verse 14. They say, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Well, fasting in the Old Testament wasn't a bad thing. Uh, it was strictly only required once a year on the Day of Atonement, but uh, many devout Jews uh, would fast more often over their sin or over the state uh, of the nation of Israel. And if done for the right reasons, then fasting was okay. But Jesus answers, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? What have John's disciples not understood about Jesus? Well, they haven't realised who Jesus is. Jesus is like, why would you fast when I'm with you? Do you realise who I am? Don't you get it? The bridegroom has come. Take a moment to think back to the last wedding celebration you went to. And imagine if all the guests at the wedding decided to turn up dressed in all black from head to toe. And uh, they decided to refuse all of the, the nice food. Uh, they wouldn't drink any of the wine because they didn't want to enjoy themselves. Rather than uh, dancing and laughing and, and having a good time, they sat in the corner and they sobbed uh, and they cried. It would be completely inappropriate, wouldn't it? And quite bizarre behaviour. We could only assume that they hadn't realised that they'd come along to a wedding. Well, Jesus is saying the same thing here. Do not realise this is a wedding and the bridegroom has come. And Jesus' claim to be the bridegroom would also have shocked a lot of his hearers. 
because in the Old Testament, God himself is described as the bridegroom. Isaiah particularly uh, talks of God rejoicing over his people, his bride. So Jesus is claiming to be God the bridegroom who has come into the world as the promised, long-awaited Messiah. And so it's not a time uh, for fasting or mourning, but it's a time uh, to rejoice while he is with them. But notice uh, in verse 15, Jesus also says, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. So the bridegroom has come, but he's going to be taken away again. What does this mean? Are we supposed to be fasting or rejoicing? Well, as we read on in Matthew, it becomes clearer. Jesus is referring to his death. And Jesus has come not just to invite us as guests to the wedding, but he's invited us to be the bride herself. The bridegroom has come for us, the church. But in order to make us his bride, he has to die, to pay the price, uh, to win us, to make us his own. And so, uh, although Jesus has gone away and isn't physically uh, with us now, he's promised to marry us. We're betrothed to him. Betrothal was an even more certain commitment than engagement is today. We were legally married, but not yet living together. It was a period where uh, wedding preparations and future marriage plans were all being worked out. And the, the Apostle Paul uh, talks of us as being betrothed to Christ, legally married, if you like, but not yet living together. We're waiting uh, for the final wedding celebration when we will be with Christ forever. And so uh, Jesus has gone uh, to prepare the wedding banquet, but he's coming back soon. And so we can rejoice uh, that we are Christ's bride and belong to him. But we live in a time of waiting. The wedding uh, banquet uh, hasn't begun yet. The final celebrations are still on hold. It's a bit like uh, buying a house. When you exchange contracts, you sign all the legal documents, you put your uh, deposit down, it's confirmed. You can't back out anymore. But you can't actually move in yet uh, and be in your new forever home until you complete the purchase on moving in day. And so uh, you live in this uh, time of waiting, waiting to move into your new home. And that's a little bit like how it is with us and, and Jesus now. And if the bridegroom has come, then we should expect things aren't just going to continue on in the same way as they had before. Things will be different. A marriage has begun. Jesus isn't just going to slot into the old ways of doing things, the old Judaism and religious fasting that John's disciples want him to. That's what he's uh, talking about with the old and the new wine skins and the new unshrunk patch uh, that can't be simply patched onto the old garment. It doesn't work like that. Jesus is bringing in something new. Well, uh, maybe you've got some questions at this stage. Perhaps you're wondering, so what? The bridegroom has come. What does that have to do with me now? Or maybe you're thinking, this is great. I think I'm a Christian, but how can I be sure that I'll be at the wedding banquet? Well, the second half of our passage gives us some answers to that. And while Jesus is still in the middle of answering uh, John's disciples, another man, likely uh, a synagogue ruler, comes and kneels before Jesus, and he has uh, an extraordinary request. Look down at that, verse 18. My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus has healed the sick, he's cast out demons, but does he have authority even over death? Well, this man thinks he's heard enough, he's convinced that Jesus can raise his daughter from the dead. But before Jesus can get very far, a woman approaches him. And we learn that she's been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
most likely this is bleeding from the womb. And so not only would she have been physically unwell, but this would have had religious and social implications for her as well. Her bleeding would have made her ceremonially unclean, so she wouldn't be able to uh, enter the temple and worship. And she would have been cut off uh, from the community, socially isolated. She was very much experiencing a living death. Some of us uh, might grumble at having to self-isolate or having to keep uh, the two-metre rule, or for this woman, that had been her life for the last 12 years. Anyone who touched her, or even just touched where she'd been sitting, would have been unclean. So she would have had significant social restrictions. But what she does have is faith. Faith that Jesus can heal her with just a touch. And after she touches his cloak, Jesus turns to the woman and says the most wonderful words, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. This is more than just physical healing, isn't it? This is salvation for the woman. She's ceremonially clean. She can enter the temple and worship again. Relationships have been restored. And she is made physically well again. By faith, she has complete salvation. But why uh, this interruption in a story about a girl that's just died? Well, I think Matthew wants us to make it make absolutely clear uh, before we go any further uh, that it's only by faith that we'll be saved. See, both the bleeding woman and uh, the dead girl's father have faith in Jesus as their saviour. But can Jesus bring salvation even uh, to this dead girl? Well, as we return to our story, uh, Jesus enters the ruler's house and he's met by mourners playing the flute and a crowd of wailing relatives sobbing over their loved one. Any death is sad, isn't it? But that of a young girl, even more uh, tragic and desperate. You can imagine how hopeless, how distraught her family must have felt. But in the midst of, of all the hopelessness and all the chaos, Jesus again has the most remarkable words. The girl is not dead, but asleep. Not dead, but asleep. And he goes inside and takes the girl by the hand and he raises her to life. Jesus is showing us that he does have authority even over death. When you go to bed at the end of the day, uh, maybe you set an alarm clock in the morning to wake you up, or maybe you just have one of these wonderful internal alarm clocks that just wakes you up uh, when the daylight appears. I always wish I could do that. Um, but either way, you know that the morning is coming, uh, that you'll wake up. You don't say goodbye to people before you go to bed, you say good night. You know uh, that you'll see them again in the morning. Sleep is just a temporary thing, and it's over when morning comes. But here, Jesus compares death, the seemingly hopeless, final, permanent end that we will all come to, to simply falling asleep. He can raise the dead just as easily as you might wake a sleeping girl from her sleep. If we're trusting in Jesus, we can face death even more confidently than when we go to bed and trust an alarm clock will wake us up in the morning. In fact, it's as if the alarm clock has already been set. The hour will come when the bridegroom will return. And when he does, the dead in Christ will be bodily raised to life. You see, the promised bridegroom has come. He's shown that he has authority even over death. He's demonstrated that he is the promised Messiah that we can put our trust in. But if we're going to put our faith in Jesus over something as big as death, then we'll want to know that he's trustworthy, that he can really uh, do what he's promising. And just a few chapters later, John the Baptist uh, sends his disciples back again to Jesus to ask him exactly that. Are you the promised one? Or should we look for another, they say. Can we really trust you? 
And Jesus replies with Isaiah's prophetic words in mind, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, see what I'm doing and believe. All of Jesus' miracles reach their climax as he raises this dead girl uh, from dead to life. He alone can offer hope in a dark world, hope beyond our dark world. He has shown that he truly is the promised Messiah. The bridegroom has arrived and we can trust him and put our faith in him. And one day, Jesus, the bridegroom, will return. And for those who have faith in him, there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. We'll enter the marriage feast, the great banquet, as his bride. He'll call our name and we'll be raised to life. There'll be no more sickness, no more uh, long-suffering illnesses like this poor woman endured. And most wonderfully of all, There'll be no more mourning and no more death. Those asleep in Christ will be raised to life. One day, the same hand that reached out and raised this girl from the dead, the same hand that just a touch could heal a bleeding woman, that same hand will wipe away each tear from our eyes. One day, death will just be this thing that we reminisce about and then turn to God and give thanks for defeating him. That's why Paul can say that we don't grieve like those who have no hope. We know Jesus is returning and so we're just asleep. Death is not hopeless, it's not permanent, it's just a temporary sleep until the wedding banquet begins. And so the resurrection of this girl is really just a sneak peek of what we can look forward to if we put our trust in Jesus. And maybe you're wondering, how is Jesus able to do all this? How can he save us? How can he raise us from the dead? Well, one place the answer is given is in the chapter before, in chapter 8, verse 17. And Matthew quotes from Isaiah 53, well-known words to many of us. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. And the next verse in Isaiah 53 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. You see, the root problem with disease and death is sin. That's what's wrong with our world. That's what's wrong with us. Paul says, the sting of death is sin, and the wages of death, what the wages of sin is death. But Jesus took up our sin and all its consequences and paid the price for them on the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions, he took the punishment for our sin, defeating sin and death on the cross. And the resurrection proves it. That's why the bridegroom had to be taken away at the beginning of our passage, taken to the cross to defeat sin and to defeat death, so that us, his bride, need not fear death anymore. Well, what is the Lord inviting us to do this morning? How should we respond to this message? Well, I think he's saying, will you trust me? Will you put your faith in me? Do you trust that the bridegroom will return? to wake us from our sleep and raise the dead? Or will we uh, scoff and laugh at Jesus' offer of resurrection life and mourn like those who have no hope? That's what the mourners do in verse 24, don't they? They had no faith in Jesus and so they laugh when he says he'll raise his dead girl to life. But notice how they're put outside. They don't get to enjoy what Jesus has come to offer. Well, if you're listening today and you're not a Christian, I'm glad you've heard this amazing news. But what will you do with it? Jesus is very clear that it is only those who have faith that will be saved and raised to everlasting life. 
And if you're not sure about that, then uh, do speak to someone afterwards. Or if you're, if you're watching online, uh, then do get in touch. Maybe uh, drop Jonathan an email uh, and ask him some more questions. But others of you uh, are probably thinking, of course I believe that, Pete. I'm a Christian. Well, that's great. But let's not forget that many who have claimed to be Christians, even Christian leaders, clergy, bishops, have gone on to later deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. Will we keep on believing in the resurrection of Jesus and therefore the resurrection of our bodies on the last day? Will we keep believing that truth? And will we allow ourselves to be comforted by that belief, not paralysed by fear, but rejoicing in the hope of being raised from the dead, not dead, but asleep? And lastly, does our faith affect our evangelism? If we really believe that Jesus can offer hope in the face of death, then what a wonderful and urgent news, a message that we have to proclaim. It's no wonder in the final verse of our passage, the news spread through all of the region. How can we keep quiet if we have such an amazing hope to share? So perhaps uh, take a moment after the service to think about uh, who it is that you might want to share this resurrection hope with this week. Maybe it's someone that you could uh, bring along to back to church uh, in a few weeks' time. Let me close and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that our bridegroom has come and shown he has authority even over death. Thank you that he's defeated death and he will one day return to wake us from our sleep and bring us to be with you forever. Would you strengthen our faith in Christ, we pray. And would this be a wonderful comfort to us this morning as we long for the bridegroom to return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Peter. Awesome. Right, we come to our last hymn, uh, In Christ Alone, Our Hope is Found, as we just heard from Peter, and uh, specifically look at verse 3, and it talks, and it says, Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. Let's stand and sing about Christ, in Christ alone, my hope is found.
We've got refreshments being served over there in seven minutes, which is brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, let's just close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time, for all we have learned, for all the encouragements we have received. Please send us out now in the power of your Holy Spirit to live for you and to serve in whatever we're doing today and in the weeks to come. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.